Okay, um, so what we need to do here today, I want you to go ahead and open up your IDEs, your IntelliJ IDEs, and I'm going to walk you through real briefly the project. The project is not due until next Wednesday, so I'm giving you a little bit of time to work through it, and we're going to go over it just a little bit today. This is your first independent programming project. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of it, but then you guys are going to be required to figure out the rest. So you got to think through logically using the tools and everything that you've learned uh, the last two weeks, as well as what you'll be learning today. Okay, you'll be incorporating that into your project. All right, so here's the scenario. Um, to encourage good grades, Kagman High School has decided to award each student a bookstore credit at NMC. That is 10 times the student's grade point average for each semester of each year. Okay, each semester a year. Um, in other words, a student with a two point grade point average receives a $20 credit. And of course, the higher the grade point average, the higher the credit uh, at the bookstore. So over a total of four years of high school, this is going to calculate out to be potentially more than $160. And uh, the scenario, this obviously this doesn't exist. I'm trying to create something that you all can think about. Uh, the scenario is designed to encourage students to attend NMC and of course prepare for college. All right, so that's the overall, overall, right? Now in the overall uh, qualifications for this project, there are a couple of things that stand out we see that there is an implicit calculation, 10 times the grade point average, right? So if it's a 2.0, 10 times that for the semester would be $20. The student had earned credit toward for, um, for the bookstore. Usually most schools have two semesters, right? So you're gonna say, a grade point average of uh, 2.0 the first year. You all obviously made more than a 2.0, right? I know you did, okay? But just to simplify it, make it easy. So 2.0, so $20 for this first semester, $20 for the second semester, right? Then you're going to continue to calculate, add up those, those um, grade point averages times the 10, right? And give the total amount. So if you think about over the total amount for year one, say a student only earned $20.50. For year two, they had a 3.2, so they got $30.20. For year three, 3.8, so it's $30.80. For year four, a 3.9, a $30.90, okay? Now, here's the catch. This example display you'll need to create, but it's not taking into account two semesters per school year. So you need to figure that out in your calculations and make sure you put the appropriate amount. The calculations I have obviously are not gonna match um, what it would be for 2018 would be double that, right? Because two semesters. So it'd be $41. Year two would be $60.20 and so forth, right? and then you'll give the final credit at the end. All right, so think about the objectives for your code. So you have to create a class, and with that in mind, go ahead and open IntelliJ, and we're gonna get this started with, we're gonna do this together, the first part. So create a new project. We'll leave, most, we'll leave all of the defaults turned off. We'll click Next. We'll leave the template turned off, and click Next. And we're going to call this the same name as our class. So if you go back and look at the code, you have to give it a class name. Where's the class name at? There it is. So we'll copy that. This will be our project name as well as our class name. Now later on, you're going to create more than one class in a project, okay? But in this instance, we're only creating one, one class. So make sure you go into here, click on the little drop down arrow, go down to source, right click on it, click Java class, 
Is everyone following along? Okay. I'm going to paste in the name again. I'm going to select a type of Java class of class and hit enter. And I have my NMC book fund. Now we know to make this executable, we need what type of method? Public, static, void, main. Do you all remember what argument it takes? String. What type of string? Thing. Yeah, well, what is the bracket thing he's called? Do you all remember? No Anyone want to make a guess? An array. Right? It's, it's called an array. And we're going to get into arrays later on here in a couple of weeks. All right? So here is your, your, your basic class you have to have. Now, let's make a comment. We know it's 10 times the GPA per semester. So think real quick, how would you write your algorithm to convert that? Just in your notes, how would you write your algorithm? So remember this is per semester, right? So think about your variables here. Let's, let's do it like this. Let's have a parenthesis, and we're going to say G, GPA uh, S1, right, for semester one. And this is going to be times 10, and this is plus another parenthesis, GPA S2 times 10. You guys understand the algorithm so far, right? So we're calculating semester by semester. Now, we know you're going to need for file input, we've been using this a lot. It's called the scanner. So in, in IntelliJ, go ahead and do scanner, right? You could, let's, uh, let's let it do auto completion for us. There we go. You could call it whatever you want to call it. Just make sure it's memorable. Okay. New scanner. And this is going to take what type of input? What type of variable is going to be required here? Uh, yeah, system.in. All right, okay, and it's asking to qualify that, so just go ahead and hit enter for that to accept the system.in. Now, system.in is going to come into this, and now you need to figure out how you're going to calculate, right? And you need to make it, make it sort of expressible. Now, we know it's quantifiable. We know that there are we're just assuming that a student is going to be at Kagman a total of eight semesters, right? So year one, semester one and two, year two, semester one and two, year three, right? So when you're doing your input, go ahead and just, for this example, create your variables to map out what you're going to be accepting from your scanner input, right? So you're going to take an int, let's see, no, I'm sorry, a double. And this is going to be something like year one, semester, or just S1, right? And it's going to be scanner, next, double. So I'm kind of feeding this to you, but if you can think about it now, you want the user 
to be presented with the information that says, hey, please give me the GPA for your, fir your freshman year semester one. So you need to make sure that is a system out print line in front of that, right? Please input, uh, it's up to you how you want to word this first, semester freshman GPA, right? Now, I've set you up with the basics. So now you have to keep in mind your notes here for the final calculation, right? That's going to give you, uh, this is going to give you basically what? Freshman year total, right? But here's the other catch. Your output has to look like this. So what is a, how are you going to get the average GPA? You have to display the average GPA for the freshman year. So you got to keep that in mind somewhere. You just don't want to throw that value away. You guys understand? So if year one S1 gives you a GPA, you want to make sure you keep that, right? And use it to do the final calculation for the, f for the first year, for the freshman year. Same thing for year two, same thing for year three. And once you calculate up the total amounts, you're going to print out a display that looks like this, except your values will be different based on the inputs you provide. Does it make sense? All right, so this is your first project. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions over emails over the next week. Okay, but this is something you all should be able to knock out pretty quickly with basic logic that you have so far. Okay, all right. So we're going to move on and uh, take a look at the assignments for this week. So there is a quiz um, that I'm trying to get put in for chapters one and two. It's just a good idea for you guys to have those reviews. And when I finally get the quiz inputted, I, I'm going to give you the ability to take it five times. Okay, so if, if you feel like you missed something, after five times, you should be able to get the right answer. Okay, so um, when I get the quiz in later this week, you can take it as many times as you want. And all of these quizzes, you'll see them again when we come to the midterm exam and the final exam. So all the questions are going to be repeated. Okay. The repetition is good here because it's going to help you to uh, know the material and be ready for the exams when they come. All right. Uh, we, we do have a um, discussion question this week, and this is going to be stretching you a little bit. It's asking object-oriented question and procedural quest, uh, pro, object -oriented programming and procedural programming. So you need to take a look at that and do a little research and, and write on that. Okay. Um, your project, which is due next Wednesday, okay, next Wednesday. So we will have a little bit of time next Tuesday in class to answer any questions if you guys get stuck. And then we have the PAs. Now remember, the PAs are your reading assignments. And since we do not have class on Thursday in person, the way this class is designed is if you're doing the PAs, it counts as your instructional period. So make sure you're doing your PAs and reading through them and, uh, and so forth. Uh, there's a couple of challenge activities this week. Uh, these are all very easy. And you're going to find in today's lecture that it's going to be redundantly easy. But there are a few getcha, gotchas, and um, we're going to go through those. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the content. Um, I'm going to go ahead and op take my IntelliJ session. I'm going to save it. I'm going to close it. I'm going to create a new project. And these are for the examples for what we're going to be doing this week with branching. So I'm just going to call it week three branches. 
and I'll go ahead and create a new source class for that and I'll call that uh, branch examples now while we're at it um, I know some of you last week were getting stuck in your coding on how to execute these these questions how to ex execute the code and I've purposely not shown you how to do it in the IDE because I want you to get um, familiar with doing it via the uh, command line all right but if you want to execute your program IntelliJ gives you a very simple way to do it and it's this red triangle red play button right here on the main method if you click on that it says run the program and that's weird let's see here Okay. Preferences. Where is it at? Well, for some reason, mine is not recognizing it. Um, let We'll come back to that in a minute. I think I set up my project without. Where where are you at? I will come back to this. Um, it should work for your alls. I think in my box I've got something wrong here, but uh, just click the run, and this will run the program for you guys. Okay. Uh, if you're trying to do it through the terminal, first thing first, make sure you know where you're at you can't run the program unless you're in the source directory so cd into the source directory okay and now you can see that i'm in the source directory of my where the class is at and if i type java c uh, branches example and i do the ls you can see that the class exists now now when i run java branches example it prints out the the code okay all right let's talk about branches all right so the example the textbook gives is the idea that you enter a restaurant and uh, the waiter says how many is in your party and you say oh I have a party of six and they look around the table and they're looking for a place that can fit a party of six the waitress or waiter in their mind they are they're looking at the tables and they're saying well can they fit in this table no this table only has two they're they're implicitly doing a branching operation in their mind so for example if the table can only fit two people then six will not work right so branches is a is a way of describing conditions, real life conditions in in logical language, right? In in procedural language of code. And we do that with the if statement. All branches are going to begin with an if. So for example, a hotel may offer a discount price to people over the age of 65. And so the branch condition that you would write would be if person age is greater than 65 then they can have the discount right that's the typical way that we write branches in UML UML stands for unified modeling language UML we typically write branches with the diamond so we have the user who enters the question and the letter a represents 
the question that's being asked. Is the question, does the question give a true or a false answer? So if it equals a true answer, then the branch goes out to, to uh, branch B. If it's a false answer, then it goes out to branch C, and then the program exit, which is the, uh, the little dot and circle at the bottom. This is typically how branches are written in UML. Now in code, we would write it simply like what you see here. We would use um, uh, if A or A is equivalent to B, and what this has to resolve to is a Boolean value. Boolean values are only true or false. So if A resolves to a true statement, then this line will be printed. The very next line underneath it will be executed. In this example, we've also included what's called an else. And an else gives you the other branch op opportunity. So you can say, if it's true, do this. If it's false, else means logically the opposite of whatever the if statement is, then do that. So in this instance, we have A equals 10. We have a scanner, next input. It's assigning that to B. So it means you'd be, you would enter a number. And then it's asking the question, is A equal to B? Well, it's going to print out, if it is, B is 10. Else, B is the value that you input and not 10. This is the typical, the typical way we execute branching. Now, there are a few gotchas here, and we're, we're going to work through them. But uh, make sure that in your if statement, you always begin with the parenthesis. The parenthesis is the part that's being evaluated. Um, we typically rep recommend that you use the curly brackets. The curly brackets, remember, is a static code block. And so when you put the if and the condition next to the static code block, you're saying whatever evaluates to true in that those parentheses statement is going to be, ex that static code block is going to be executed. All right, you guys understand so far? All right, very basic stuff. So here's, here's, a, here's an example where we now have an if else attached with another if and another else. And so this, this example gives us if A equals B, well, the system is going to print out A equals B. Else, if A equals C, then we'll print out, well, okay, A equals C. Otherwise, it doesn't match any of the above conditions, and we're going to say it does not equal to B or C. So when we think about how to propose that, uh, you can think of a number of different scenarios. Maybe it is, um, maybe it's, uh, you know, the age of whether or not you can drive, right? If student is 15, they can get a learner's permit, but they have to drive with an adult, right? That's that's the law, right? So then, if the student though is greater than 15, but less than, I don't know what the, what the requirement is here in the CNMI, is it 18, 17, 16 plus six months, right, with where they have the permit, right? then the student can drive, but then for six months they have to drive with an adult. Otherwise, have at it, right? That's how we, we regulate the logical pattern. We describe it in code, okay? And the more, you, the more you do this, the more you write the code, the more, um, the more fluent you're going to be at doing this. And, of course, this week you're going to have lots of practice. And in the project, this is a great opportunity to, to, to have that practice, to, uh, to work with that. Okay? All right, so... Typically what we're doing, we're detecting if two items are equal to each other. And if they are inside that parenthesis, then we execute what's in the braces. So the example always uses an equality statement and we're not using an equal statement. 
In math, we use a single equal statement, but not in, not in coding, okay? In Java and in C++, C, C Sharp, Objective-C, Swift, JavaScript, a lot of languages, okay? Equal sign is only used for assignment. If you want to make sure you're checking value, you use the double equal signs. Okay. All right, let's do a quick coding example to follow along with this. Go ahead and open up in your IntelliJ uh, books. We're going to create a scanner. And I'll just call it scanner lowercase equals new scanner system.in to accept input from the terminal. Um, and uh, let's see here. We're going to we're going to model out just a um, simple scenario of um, library books. Uh, we'll think about something here. Let's see. Uh, system out print line. Um, Let's do something more simple. Let's do the driving age thing. Since I've already we've already talked about it. All right, so um, please input age. You notice here I have the LN, which means which means new line, right? And I'm going to say scanner next. Where are you at? Next int. I'm going to assign this to um, an age. And then I'm going to say if age is equal to 15. You can have a, let's see, have only a learner's permit until you reach 16. Okay. So, We'll go down here to right after the curly bracket, we'll write else if parenthesis age equals 16. System, I don't know why I did that. Let's make it easier on myself. System out print line. Oh, thank you. Uh, you can have a real license after, I can't read, learner's permit is completed. Okay. And then else. I don't have enough information at this time to make a decision. All right. We're we're going to do that in just a minute. Yeah, well, we're going to get to those in a minute. Um, let's go ahead and take our class. We can see that we need to compile it, so we'll do Javac uh, branches example. And to make things simple for you, if you're in the terminal and you're typing, your up arrow and down arrow is your friend, okay? The up arrow captures, it caches whatever you've typed before, 
And so you can just kind of up and down to make this quicker. All right, so please input your age, 15. You can only have a learner's permit, right? All right, expect it. Let's run it again, 16. You can have a real license after a learner's permit is completed. All right, we'll run it again. Uh, let's say 21, right, because that's what we've coded. Now, Michael has pointed out something really important. How do we make this code more expressive? And we naturally make it more expressive with greater than or less than symbols. So let's go back to our text, our, our notes here. Before we get to that, though, um, we already know that the double equal means equal to, but you can also say not equal to, and that is the exclamation equals. So if we go back to our code example and we add in another one and say if age is not equal to, uh, let's say 14, Yeah, it would. It would. If we embedded this, and um, this is the part I was just thinking about here. Let's, let's take this logic and put uh, right here. Yeah, that's actually not a good example. Uh, let's say if age is not 15 and age is not 16, right? Um, what would happen is if the age is not 15 or 16, then any number I put in would actually run in this scenario as long as it's not 15 or 16. And in reality, if I put in 16, the, n the place it's going to enter first is here. And then it'll exit out because it falls into that bucket first, right? Um, using the not symbol is typically good if you have a scenario where, where you're using a Boolean and we say um, is false. Uh, equals false, right? What this result uh, uh, evaluates to is a false statement. If the number does not equal this, that it flips the false to become a true. So anytime you add the exclamation mark in front of it, you're taking what could have been a false statement and said if it meets that false criteria consider it consider it true does that make sense so you take the you take a false criteria and you say if it matches the false criteria here make it a true statement because the only way this is going to be executed is if it re, if it uh, resolves to the boolean value true all right we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later all right, so as Michael was saying, this is how we would accomplish this. So, uh, Clayton, I'm picking on your name here. I'm not saying you're six years old, okay? <laughs> but let's just go ahead and copy um, this code. I'm going to copy this because I don't want to have to type all that again. And we'll come over here, paste this in. And we're going to say the age is six. So we'll put in age there to assign it. System out print line. Kindergarten. System out print line. Junior high. 
System out print line, high school. System out print line, join the military. I know you don't want to join the military, right? Are you are you U.S. citizen or a yeah. Korean? Yeah. And that's always a big question for all of our Korean fo uh, folks out there because they have to go back after high school and spend, I think it's what, two years? Do you know? Yeah. Anyways, all right, so now if we run this code, let's go ahead and run it and see what we have. I'm going to clear my screen. Execute it by typing javac branch examples. I'll run it. Input the age. And let's do seven. Well, that doesn't make sense, right? But according to the logic, it does. Because I've said if Clayton's age is less than six, do this. Else, Clayton's age is less than 12, right? He, he falls into it. So to make it more expressive, what we'd want to do is something like this. We would, we would add, um, we would add two statements. Clayton age is greater than five and. Now we're testing for ranges. And um, I'm getting ahead of my, my, uh, my, my uh, slides here, but the double ampersand is equivalent to saying and. Okay, so now we'll save it. We're going to run the code again, compiling it, running it, enter the input. If I put seven, well, yeah, because my number here, right? So we want to say, um, yeah. I should have elementary school in here, right? That's what I'm missing. Let's put that in there. Let's do else if Clayton age is greater than five and Clayton age is less than uh, 12. It's elementary. All right, now we would change this and say 11 and less than I don't know what, 14? All right, let's run it again. So you input the age, we'll put seven areas elementary. We'll run it again. We'll say uh, 12 is junior high. Run it again, we'll say 16 is high school, right? Um, so that's how we kind of develop and work with ranges and, and um, ranges between numbers. Let's go back here. So we have these relational operators. These are the same that you use in mathematics. Um, greater than or equal to, it gives you that that expressive expressivity where if you want to say up to the exact number instead of right below the number so for example here I'm saying less than five which means really if they're four right but if I wanted to say no they're less than or equal up to five then it would capture that amount okay all right Simple relational operators. You guys, these are these are the same that you use in in algebra and and so forth. Okay. All right. Now we're getting into logical and or and not. Okay. So and or not. We've already seen one, and that's the double uh, the double ampersands. 
so logical AND is A and B. These are true when both of its operands are true. So if we go back to our code here, what that means is when this is true and this is true, both of these conditions have to be true in order for this, this to work. Okay? However, logical OR is true when at least one of the operators is true. So that gets tricky. If I wanted to say logical OR, then I've, well, really anything greater than five would fall into that, right? So you have to be careful with logical ORs. So any, you want to look for, um, because if I enter a number that's, say, 6, well, let's say I enter a number that's 19, it doesn't matter if it's less than. It, it, all it has to do is satisfy one side of the true statement. So you have to be careful when you're using logical ORs. All right? And then you have not, and not is is an operand for, for uh, false. Not is the exclamation mark. So when we, when we would do that, we would say Clayton is not five. Okay. All right. So here's the examples again. You have your ampersands for and, your double back, your double uh, straight lines for, um, for ORs, and if you look on your keyboard, you're, you really don't see that pipe symbol too often, but it's over there next to your return key. You guys see it on your keyboards? Because you might be later going, where is that key at? I never use that key, right? It's right over there. It's, it's usually, it has the backslash right next to it. It's, it's a double key. You have to use the shift to, to access it. Okay, any questions? All right. So, you know, just same example again. If the user channel is greater than or equal to 2 and user channel is less than or equal to 499, then the channel type is a single character code of S. Else if the channel is greater than or equal to 1002 and less than 1499, right? Otherwise, the channel type is E. This is the typical way they're doing it. Now, um, in my code example back here, I didn't include it, but it's actually better for readability to do it like this, to make sure you put the parentheses around what you're trying to evaluate. Because when you're debugging your code later, it'll make a lot more sense to you, okay? All right, so basic ranges with gaps. So we can do this a number of different ways. Um, Typically, we would um, separate our if-else statements like I did earlier, right? We can also use multiple distinct if statements. Uh, let, me, let me go back to the code base here, and we'll run an example. We're going to take out all of this. And we're going to say if... Clayton age is greater than five. Actually, let's let's do it like this. Okay. Now, think about logically what's different here. In the previous example, when it was if else, the value that comes in is going to get trapped in one of the if else's, right? But here, if a value comes in, it will, it will go to the first one, and then it exits the if. It'll be evaluated by the second one, and then exit the if. Evaluated by the third one, and then exit the if. Um, those are those type of 
multiple if statements are good for uh, for managing the state of something. Say that you want something to happen to a particular object in your code and and it needs to happen in steps. This is the way you would do that. If you try to do it with if else statements, uh, you wouldn't be able to achieve it. But by doing by by separating by multiple ifs, you could achieve uh, modifying a value based on steps and criteria, right? It could be some type of a calculation. Clayton age could change for each calculation. And as it goes down, if, it, if it's able to fall into the next if statement, then it would fall into that one. That's the, the idea by having multiple ifs. No, you don't have to. Now this last one, I still kept an else, but you don't have to have an, have an else when you have multiple ifs. As well, you can, um, you can embed your if statements. Now, your code can tend to get kind of ugly and hard to read at this point, but you can very well embed multiple if statements and branches. And as you can see here, the idea is if the number of items is greater than three, then you're gonna go into this next set of branching statements. Well, if the total cost is greater than 100, then you do that. If else the total cost is 50, sales discount is that. And this all deals with this first set of values, the number of items, right? Else if, down here, if it's five, then you could have another set of, of nested if else statements, okay? Uh, I believe in week six, we're going to be getting into user-defined methods. And this is where your code really begins to shine because with user-defined methods, you could, you could embed this logic in a method and then call it from inside of one if statement so to clean up your logic a little bit, make it more readable, okay? As well as make it repeatable. All right, let's go on. Um, so common, common branching errors. This is, this is very, uh, very common for a lot of new programmers. When you're programming an if statement, you're not required to have a curly bracket. You're not required to have that static block there. You can write it just like this. However, the common error that a lot of developers make is, is thinking this last line will also be executed. In an if else statement, it only executes the first line underneath it. Even if it has curly brackets? No, if it has curly brackets, it'll execute it. But if you don't, if you don't have curly brackets, it won't execute that last line. So in this scenario, is it true? It would print out, yes, it's true. Else, system mount print line, no, it's not true. And usually you would think it would skip over this last statement. But what would happen is if it's true, it'll print this statement and it'll print this bottom statement. Because remember, it only reads the first. So this bottom statement here is not a part of this else. That's where you got to remember it's a good idea to put those curly brackets. Curly brackets make it more readable and it protects you from those common common errors. Um, another common mistake is what we've talked about quite often, saying if A equals 10 versus A is equivalent to 10. This actually won't compile. It will it'll throw a mistake. Now in JavaScript, uh, it will execute and it will treat this as a true statement and execute this. And so you've done a number of things. You've assigned in JavaScript, you've assigned the 10 to the A and treats it as a true statement and does that. In Java, it will not execute uh, because Java is strongly typed. It will not allow it to, to go. But uh, in a lot of programming languages, this is a common mistake that people make. Okay, so order of evaluation. Um, very important. You're going to see this in your Zy books. Make sure you pay close attention to these. The order of evaluation and operation. Um, 
your logical ands, they take precedence over logical ors. Logical ands take precedence over ors. Okay? All right. I'm not going to go through this completely because you guys are going to read this one and do some labs on that one. All right. Uh, another common uh, error. Um, thinking that you can write it like this. 16 is less than the age, which is le less than 25. And you might be able to do that in your math classes, but you can't do it in Java. You actually have to write it like this. 16 is less than that age, and the age is less than 25, right? You have to write it out and separate it with that, the logical and statement. All right, you guys good so far? Okay. Uh, logical and and the bitwise operation. Now, bitwise operation actually deals with the, the state of a bit. So a bit is 0 or 1, a byte is 4 bits, 4 bytes is a word, and it, it finally adds up to an int, okay? When you're dealing with the logical AND, always make sure you include both. If you just say this, then you're going to get in what is called bitwise operand types. And, and in this class, you're not going to be dealing with that. Uh, it gets very complex. Uh, if you take a more advanced Java course at the university somewhere, you'll get into bitwise operations. But for what we're doing, you're, we're not going to be doing that. Just remember just to keep it doubled, right? So double ampersands for AND and double pipe statements for OR. Both of these are exclusively used in their single instances for bitwise operations. Okay. All right, let's look at a switch case statement. So as you get to writing your if-else statements, you're going to find that you wish there'd be an easier way to figure out where the code should exit instead of writing these long if-else statements. And the way you do that is with a switch statement. You can more clearly represent multi-branch multi behaviors. All right? So, let's see here. In this example here, we have um, the value that comes in, which is, in this case, it's an integer. And I've highlighted the color so you can understand it. If the A is a zero, it's going to, it's going to hit case zero and execute whatever is here. And then it hits this code line called break. And what break does is it tells it to break out of the switch statement and go to the end. Okay? So if A is 1, then it's going to hit here. If A is 2, it'll hit here. Otherwise, it's going to go down to default and uh, we'll print unknown and it will break. All right? So let's go ahead and run an example of it real quick here. We'll use Clayton's age again. Clayton, are you okay with me picking on you? All good. All good? All right. So we have Clayton age. So we're going to say switch Clayton age. Go out here and put a curly bracket. Hit enter. Case um, zero. You are too young. Break. Oops. Case one. You are still too young. Okay. Let me go back and make sure I got my syntax right here. Ah, oh, thank you. Break. 
case, you know, three. Okay. Yep. Break default. He grew up too quick. Yes. It will only match whatever is in the case. So, in this example, the way we're doing this, let's go ahead and compile it. We'll enter the age to, he grew up too quick. What happened? You guys understand that the number two didn't match cases zero, one, or three. And because it didn't match those, it went to default and it, it exited out, right? So we could run it again and we could do uh, three and it's yep, right? Run it again, we could do zero. He's too young, right? All right, so another interesting way that we could do this is we could say case one, case two, case three, case four. I'm sorry? Well, what's going to happen? Let's see. I've already got a three, right? We'll fix that. We'll do this as a 20. So what's going to happen is if I enter a two, because there's no break statement on case zero, case one, case two, case three, case four, there's no break, it will enter and hit each of these and go, nope, 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 nope. And it'll fall in. And it'll say, yeah, Clayton is in this range, right? The break statement protects you. It keeps you within a certain bracket. Now, at the same time, we can also use uh, in the switch case. In this instance, it is a, uh, it's an int. But we can also do these as, as strings. We can do them as characters. We can do them as um, a lot of different things. And the case statement then can match whatever is the value that you input. And it'll output the operation. Guys, any, got any questions so far? Do y'all need to stand up and stretch? Everyone good? You falling asleep on me? Okay. All right, so now we get to the Boolean data type. Now, I've told you before, all, all branches in the question has to answer, it has to re uh, resolve to a true-false statement in order for that branch direction to be resolved. So it has to go, it has to be true or false. And the way we declare Booleans is simply just by, um, by typing in the name of the variable, Boolean, and... Um, Right? So we declared the variable, but the value is unassigned. So let's, um, let's go back to Clayton's case here. And we're going to say if the case is 0 through 10, I'm going to change this to 5 because I don't have to type that out a bunch more. All right? We're going to do this. We're going to say... Uh, what was the value? Too cute. We'll say true. And then, sorry Clayton, down here it's not true. All right.
So in this scenario, we're going to read the value. It's going to fall into a certain age range. We're going to assign whether the variable is true or not, and then read it out. Okay. So if we run the, we'll, X, we'll uh, compile it again. We'll run it and we'll say, uh, Did it? Oh, I do, don't I? Okay, so let's make that. There you go, good catch. There we go. And it's compiled again with an error. Let's see. Yes, because it hasn't been initialized. Well, so in this instance, um, it could exit the program, so we'll have to we'll have to come down here and under the default, we'll have to say too cute is false. And I know I can spell and type, so let's do that. <sighs> My goodness, it's still going to complain. Okay, so we'll go ahead and assign the variable. Compile it. We run it. We'll input four. There you go. Sorry, Clayton, the verdict is true, right? We'll run it again. We'll put in um, 18. Sorry, Clayton, the verdict is false. He grew up too quick. So that's with the Boolean variable. And Booleans are important because a lot of the operations you're going to use in Java are going to be measuring these true false statements. It's the simplest way to evaluate things. In fact, when you're writing your code, you would often want to take the scanner input and answer some basic questions. Like, you're going to answer questions up front. So, Boolean um, is too young and we would say uh, equals and this is where we're going to use a special type of, uh, of operation you're going to be getting into and this is called a ternary expression or ternary operator so we're going to evaluate the input which is, let's do it like this, int age scanner next int. We're going to evaluate the age and say age is less than, uh, let's see, 16. Question mark, too young. We're going to say yes, it's too young. Otherwise, we use a colon and we say false. So in this instance, we evaluate this for true and then we assign the value back. So if you run the code, we'll say uh, 7. And of course, I didn't output anything, so let's system out print line is Clayton. Sorry, you are. Let's do it like this. Let's make it fun. If is too young is true. Sorry, too young. Else, system out print line, too, sorry, too old. All right. Right? We'll compile it again. We'll run it. We'll input. Uh, Let's say 
16. Sorry, too old. We'll run it again. We'll input 15, too young. So you can do a lot of things here with assigning the variables, storing them in advance, and then operating on the Boolean. So in this example, we've, ev we've done the evaluation up front, and then we've, we've stored it in a true-false statement. Then all we have to do is just check the statement itself because the operation that's evaluated was done in advance. Similarly, you can do other types of evaluations with ternary expressions. You could create a string and you could say this is the message and if <clears throat> is too young is true, the message could be sorry too young colon sorry too old whoops so in this instance you could do away with all of this logic and you could just output the message right Run it again. Input the age, and it'll evaluate. So that is important parts about your data your data types. Now, we're going to get in. We have just a few minutes here left, and we're going to talk about string comparisons. Um, string comparisons, you cannot use the double equal signs to compare a string. And this is because when you create a string, it's creates them in a exact memory location and the equal sign is actually comparing the locations and not the value. So anytime you try to compare two strings together, um, let's, let's do it like this. System out print line, enter your name and string name equals scanner next line and um, string let's see final static string my name Who's someone's name in class we could, you wouldn't mind me using? Sorry, Clayton, I didn't ask your permission earlier, man. Anybody mind me using their name? Anybody want to nominate somebody? Yeah. Who? Yeah. K. K. All right. Uh, spell her name for me. K -K okay. So in this example, uh, We'll just take out the static for right now. In this example, we have the string, and we're going to do, let's see, a system, let's see, Boolean. Um, is name the same? We're going to set up a ternary operation. We're going to do name equals my name. System out print line, um, and we'll just output the the value. Okay, so if we run this and we type in K K Y E and hit enter, oh, I didn't. I'm not paying attention, am I? There we go. K Y E and hit enter. It's false, and this is because the string is actually doing comparison of memory locations instead of the actual value of the location. So you can't use equality statements for that. But the way you get around that is you use what is called the equals statement. And equals is, is a built-in method on the string 
object that allows you to compare two strings and see if they are the same. So if we run it again now using the equals method, there we go. We type in K, we're going to see it's true because we're comparing the value. Now, equals does not, uh, equals does not handle case sensitivity. Equals is, it has to be exactly the same letters. So if we run it again, and I say K-A-Y-E, it's going to be false because we're not, we're not thinking about case sensitivity. If we want, to, we want to ignore the case, we say name equals ignore case, and that will give us the ability to then um, test the name, whether it's lowercase or uppercase. So we'll run it again. And to give you an example, we'll, I may have messed that all up. There we go. Now it worked. I made it all uppercase, and it's still evaluated to true. The, the name also does some very interesting, um, there's also some very interesting things you could do here with name as well. For example, let's take that out. If you want to compare values, there is a method on the string called compare to. So if we say if we say name compare to another string and we put in my name, what this is going to return is a value between negative one and zero, I believe it is. Um, and Let's just output the value just so you guys can see it. We'll run it again. And I'm going to input the name exactly. And if I put the name exactly, it should equal, yeah, it equals zero. However, if I run it and this time do lowercase, it'll give us a different value because the comparison is different. So let's, let's change this up a little bit. Let's change that to a lowercase. We'll run it again. And I'll type this with the uppercase. Now it gives a negative 32. So what you have to do then when you're doing compare to, compare to is important and it's a key method that's used in a lot of later objects you're going to see with, with, uh, with collections. And it's important because compare to gives you the ability to order your lists. It does the comparison individually and then the method when it's fired, it internally calls compare to and it's checking whether it's greater than or less than zero. And it will actually order uh, alphabetically order things for you, all right? Again, if you want to use compare to, there's also ignore case as well. Uh, other things that you can do with strings, we can evaluate a character at an index. So say we only want to see the first letter of the string that's inputted, right? So the way we would do that is we would use the zero index. Strings are at its core char arrays. They're character arrays. And so if you look at K, the first letter is index zero, second letter is one, third letter is two, and so on. Always remember that with index arrays, the the, the starting point is a zero. This will throw a lot of people off. But this, this will give us then, of course, if I, we run this, it'll give us um, the value of, of the first letter. We could change it and do three and we will run it again. And three should give us an E. Could you say like three and zero? Or would you have to just make two separate statements? 
like uh You would have to, because you're inside of a system out print line, you'd have to use the plus operator. And then you could do this. You could say, you could do that. And when you ran that application, yeah, do y'all know what happened? The character, we're doing a plus symbol, so we actually have to do something like this. It converted, it actually gave you the ASCII number, added it together, and then outputted it. So you have to uh, think about your... Think about your conversions. Okay, guys, we're at the end of our class. Um, we've covered just about everything. The only thing we didn't we didn't cover was the concat statement, and um, there's a couple other things. Uh, strings are immutable, which means that. The methods, uh, the methods that operate on a string, so for example, my name, and if I was to use uh, the method concat and take in name, and do this, compared to this, they'll produce different values. My name is immutable, and when I run the method on it, it's going to output the concatenated value, but it will not change the value itself unless you assign it back to itself again. Okay, and that's all we have for today. Um, I've got the recording for those who want to go back through it. Of course, there are some who are sick, and, um, and it'll be available for those as well. Okay? Uh, we will not be meeting on Thursday. If you need to reach out to me, have any questions, I am available. I work from home, and I'm always on the computer checking email and working. So if you have questions, just let me know.